Thank you, Gloria, for the beautiful music that leads us into our worship time, and I welcome you all here. Good morning, everyone. We are here to worship, and as we join together, let's read responsively from Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. I will meditate on your wonderful works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Let us join as we sing together, I know whom I have believed. Let us stand. Father God, as we join together in worship, we lift up your name. You have shown yourself to us. We see you in creation. We see you in the cross. We see you in the empty tomb. We see you by your spirit in our lives. And we come here today, Father, to worship you and to honor you for your blessings, for your gift, and for your grace that you have bestowed on us. We honor you with our lives. May all that we think, all that we say, all that we do, In this time and going forward, bring praise to your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Reading Psalm 145, I want to continue in that passage that we began. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. The choir now will sing Compassion Hymn.
Thank you, choir. That was an anthem, a prayer, a story of love. And as we come together for prayer this morning, what does our world need to hear, folk? They need to know that God loves them and his compassion for them is unending. I'm going to leave the speaking to Keith this morning, but at the same time, I, I just am so overwhelmed with the compassion that God has for us. And there are so many times that we just feel, oh, you can't love me that much. <laughs> I'm not worthy of that kind of love. 
But then we have to stop ourselves and say, am I telling God what to do? We're not telling God what to do. He says, I love you because I loved you first. What are you going to do with it? Can you love me back? Can you love others like I love you? As we come to prayer, as we hear the news of the night and the morning, our hearts are continually being broken and stirred by the tragedy and the events of our world. And on a personal level, I know the stories that are going on here in people's lives, the hurt, the pain, the struggle. God knows all about it, and he says, I'm here. Let's just come into his presence as we remind ourselves that he's here to meet us where we're at. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for who you are. We are awed by your majesty, blinded by your glory, and overwhelmed with your compassion. Father, you have touched our world with a light that cannot be hidden. We thank you, Father, for making your light known to those who are willing to take your word and to trust you. And our prayer, Father, is that we will be continuing to follow after you as we see your love in our lives and turn that love around and express it to those around us as we meet people where they're at, in their pain, in their struggle, in their joy, in their success. But we come to you know, knowing, Father, that you are the one that is fulfilling and working out your plan around us. Difficult for us to comprehend and understand, but Father, you know the big picture. You know what you have in order. And our prayer, Father, is that as you have called us to live lives of peace, may we pray for that peace in this world. That you will speak into the hearts and lives of those that are in control of nations. Of peoples. That we will see your name lifted up and glorified in these days. Father, I pray for those that are struggling here this morning with health concerns. I just thank you that you're walking with them. You are surrounding them with your love, that you are surrounding them with your care, that you are meeting them where they need to be met. And may we be receptive of your love and care and just allow us to know that peace that passes all understanding. We pray, Father, for our church, your church, on this corner in Fredericton, that it will be continuing to show for, forward a light that proclaims you in all that we say and all that we do. May all of our words, our actions, point people to you, to know you, to trust you, to walk with you, and to know the power of your presence of, and compassion in their lives. We pray, Father, for your name to be honored and glorified as we move forward in this world. And we give you all praise, and glory, and honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue in worship as we sing together, There's Something About That Name. <laughs>
be seated. Well, we're so glad that Keith is able to be here this morning. And uh, we know God's given you a word, Keith, and we just look forward to hearing it. Thanks. Great. It's good to be together. Yeah. Appreciate it. Glory to God. Yeah. Hey, all right. Morning, everyone. Balcony, good to see you. I trust you. Don't be fooling around up there. Guess what happened to me? Almost one year exactly today, uh, one year ago, guess what happened? It was the last, last day of the semester, last class. You know what's coming next, the final exam, last class, okay? And a student came up to me looking frightened and asked politely, are you going to give a review? Do you know what I'm talking about? Last part. Mm, yeah, yeah, some of you reprobates do know. <laughs> I said, well, that's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you've missed half the lectures this semester, so I don't know if it's so much a review as much as new material. <laughs> but, you know, I'm getting old and getting soft, and so I gave a review. And it was very helpful for that student this past year when they passed the course. If you're not laughing, you need to, yeah, put down your device and dial in because in that same spirit of generosity, we're going to have a review this morning. Two weeks ago it was Easter, and Mark chapter 12 seems to me to provide an amazing review of the Easter season, so that's where I would invite you to turn right now. However, just before we get to a parable about a vineyard this morning in Mark 12, this, it's going to be an amazing moment. It happens between uh, Palm Sunday and Easter, uh, yeah, Good Friday, Easter weekend. Uh, it, it'll be remarkable. It's a turn there, Mark 12. But just before, we're going to have a look at a couple of lyrics that are found in Isaiah chapter 5. What we're going to suggest is this actually provides the backstory to Mark 12. And we maybe going to get uh, Martine or Elaine or can't see without a certain pair of glasses, that's how old I am, but I, I assume there's somebody up there that can flash on Isaiah chapter 5 for us, and I want you to picture a poet on the street uh, who's hired a band and is singing these lyrics in the first part of Isaiah 5, listen, because the prophet declares, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up, cleared it of stones, planted it with the choicest of vines. There he built a watchtower in it and cut out a vine press as well. And then, behold, looked for a crop of good grapes, but alas, it yielded only bad fruit. And at this point, the music stops from that hired band. And the prophet shoots straight. And says, now, you dwellers in Jerusalem and you people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? And when I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad, only sour, only awful tasting fruit? Now, Isaiah 5, just a few things to consider about this passage. And first of all, you have to appreciate that Isaiah is considered one of the great Hall of Fame prophets in the Bible. I have to remind my students, those who attend lectures, that is, that prophets, you know, they, they don't gaze into this crystal ball. They aren't these sort of fortune tellers or just predictors of the future as such. The vast majority are poets and songwriters, and they use their gifts of the imagination to be able to bring people back to God. And Isaiah is among the finest of these poets, and that's Easy to prove, because as you scroll through the New Testament, there's dozens of quotes, allusions, and echoes to his vast prophetic repertoire. So prophets are artists, and there's this great diversity of personalities. Some, like Elijah, were rugged and lived in the outback. By contrast, Isaiah is more urbane and sophisticated. He's almost aristocratic in his bearing, and Isaiah lived during a period that was turbulent and full of challenges. The historian John Bright characterizes this era as one that is pampered with a concern only for material possessions and pleasures, with a broken moral compass and without much 
trust in God. And you get the sense as you look through the book of Isaiah that there's a looming judgment as the Assyrian army inexorably works its way toward the land of promise. Warnings have been given repeatedly over a long period of time through many different kinds of voices and all have been ignored and so judgment through invasion is at hand and it's deserved. But you know, through it all, God continues to reach out to this wayward people and keeps giving poets like Isaiah messages of repentance to deliver even though the citizens don't have much intention of listening. You know, the other day a professor in an, another city was, was complaining to me about something, complaining to me about the low attention span in students these days. Can you imagine? Yeah. Hmm. And saying it as though this was some kind of new thing. And I'm afraid not. I mean, look at the early oracles in the book of Isaiah. Here's one of the greatest poets who's ever lived in the midst of ancient Jerusalem, and everybody just tunes him out. But he doesn't give up. And what does the poet do in chapter 5? Isaiah writes a song. He's trying to reach their hearts. And the central image in that song, as we heard, is a vineyard. I was suggesting that he hires this band to play the song on the street corner. This song about a vineyard, which people would know elsewhere in the Bible, is used to symbolize the relationship between God and God's people. That's why as you read through the Psalms, for example, you'll come across Psalm 80 that declares, you transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and you planted this vine. You cleared the ground for it and it took root. It filled the land. Even the mountains were covered with its shade and its growth the mighty cedars with its branches. And these branches reached as far as the sea and its shoots as far as the river, as far as the Mediterranean on the west and the Euphrates on the east, the vineyard. That's why in Isaiah 5, you and I heard about this vineyard on a fertile hillside, cleared of stones, planted with the choicest of vines, along with this watchtower for security. And all of this, Isaiah's inviting us to conclude represents God's dream for a people who will bring forth a crop of righteousness and gratitude. And that does not happen. This vineyard, as we heard, does not bear good fruit, only bitter, sour grapes, indicative of a squandered opportunity. So despite all the patient care that God's lavished upon it, this vineyard has produced only a worthless crop. And in Isaiah's day, we see that the vineyard was virtually destroyed and trampled by ruthless invaders. That's why I'm suggesting we keep all of this vineyard imagery in mind as we turn now finally to Mark chapter 12, which as mentioned takes place during that interval after Palm Sunday and before Good Friday. Okay, You'll recall Mark chapter 11, for example, because that was our Palm Sunday message not so long ago, where Jesus enters Jerusalem where there's a big crowd, and you'll remember because the kids were running around looking a bit random and out of control, which is fine, but, you know, waving palm branches, that's when the people were shouting the lyrics of Psalm 118, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna, in the highest heaven. Right afterwards, what does Jesus do? Enters the temple courts and begins to drive out those who are buying and selling, overturning the Temp, uh, tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and wouldn't allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. When he's later confronted by the religious authorities, they can't really answer any of the questions that Jesus has for them. And it's at this point that we now reach chapter 12 and you and I hear this story that's actually going to be our functional review of the Easter message this morning. If we could flash that on the screen now, I think it's Martine, I'd be grateful. Listen close, because at this point, beginning of Mark 12, Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. At once upon a time, he said, there was a guy who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. 
And then he leased the vineyard to some tenants and moved to another place. Well, at harvest time, he then sent a servant to the tenants to receive from them some of the fruits of the vineyard. But they seized that servant. And they beat him up, sent him away empty-handed. So the master sent another servant to them. But him they also struck on the head, treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed, till finally he had one left, one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they'll respect my son. But the tenants said one to the other, this is the heir, come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him, threw him out of the vineyard. So what then will the owner of the vineyard do? Well, he'll come and he'll kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Or haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew that he'd spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and they went away. Mark chapter 12, a whole lot of biblical history, as you may have recognized, is contained in this parable, and right away, I'm sure all of us heard that reference to Isaiah 5 and the song about the vineyard. We earlier noted that the vineyard is used as an image that conveys the idea of God's dream for humanity, for you and I. And so in this parable, we can suggest that the man, the guy, the planter, the vineyard owner, is a picture of God designing our lives. And there's a theology of creation here. There's a stewardship of the earth that emerges. And the vineyard represents the kind of cooperative venture that God intends. I mean, think about it. A vineyard needs God to be involved, right? Providing rich soil, warm sunlight, clean water, this lush hillside. But the vineyard also needs human cultivation in order to flourish. God gives gifts to each one of us. And don't be one of these Canadians who says, oh, you know, with this mock humility, God doesn't give me any gifts because that's... Just, just don't do that. God gives gifts to each one of us and says, go out and use them and do so creatively. Let's see what you can do. That's why in the parable we read, then he leased the vineyard to some tenants and he moved to another place because God is not some oppressive micromanaging helicopter parent. Do you know what those are? Helicopter parents? My kids said that to me. Quit helicopter parenting. What, are you going to come with us on your honeymoon? <laughs> on our honeymoon? <clears throat> you know, God says go for it, and together let's rejoice in what you produce. And that's why harvest time has such rich potential in verse 2 of our parable at harvest time what did he do he sent a servant to the tenants to receive from them some of the fruit of the vineyard and you would expect such an emissary from the very owner to be received with dignity with great respect and that's why verse 3 was so appalling as they seized that servant beat him up sent him away empty-handed then he sent another servant. They struck that one on the head, treated him shamefully. Another who they killed, many others, beat, destroyed. And gradually, you and I are starting to perceive that the servants in this parable are actually a, a chorus of prophetic voices sent to remind and instruct the people about the character of God and the responsibility of human beings. Some of my students weren't in class last month because they were caught up in March Madness. Do you know what that is? I found out. It's a reason why you don't have to come and listen to me, I guess. But it paused uh, or invited me to think that if you're a, a sports fan, you'll, you'll, you'll realize automatically that prophets and coaches actually have a lot in common, right? Think about it. What does a coach do? 
besides get fired, that is. What, what does a coach do? Ideally, they, they, they remind players, instruct them, rebuke, encourage, point things out. You know what I fear? I fear that even the best coaches can get ignored by those players who have a sense of entitlement. Jeremiah once stood at the entrance to the temple gate in downtown Jerusalem, and he boldly cried out, from the time your ancestors left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent you my servants, the prophets, but they did not listen to me. They did not pay attention. They were stiff-necked. They did more evil than even their ancestors. In our parable, we heard that the servants are beaten up and, and worse, probably because of greed and selfishness. You know that part of humanity that defiantly says, this is mine, I can keep whatever I grow for myself, I'm in charge, I don't need anyone telling me what to do. Isaiah himself was rejected. And his song of the vineyard should have been number one on the billboard charts. Instead, the song was callously dismissed, and it was probably deleted from the ancient equivalent of Spotify. You know, as we're listening to the parable in Mark 12, I mean, at some point, I think you got to say, Why? what landowner would do this? I mean, who would do this? Sending servants repeatedly just to be abused. I mean... Why does the landowner keep doing that? Instead of sending more servants, what he should have done is send an armed militia. I mean, get some revenge and some retribution. That is what the landowner should have done. But this isn't your typical landowner, is it? And rather than send an army, he keeps pleading with peace and more messengers. And most poignant, it was verse 6 in the parable. Do you remember? After all those horrific beatings, the owner still had one left to send a beloved son, sending him last of all, hoping they'll respect my son, won't they? But they do not. They don't respect the son, and by some twisted logic, they convince themselves that this is a chance to seize the inheritance, and apparently unaware of how ridiculous their notion is, they kill the son in cold blood. So, Level with me, Jesus asks. How should this story end? I mean, it should end, he says, with poetic justice. With a measure for measure retribution. Exactly as they treated others, so they should be treated themselves. Those wicked tenants should be destroyed, and the vineyard should be given to someone else. And we should probably acknowledge that the main way this parable has been interpreted is that, well, those wicked tenants, they're the leaders of Jerusalem, they'll be replaced by the Gentiles, and they'll be new leaders who do a better job of running the vineyard. And there's probably a sliver of truth there, but, but listen, because even the simplest of parables has more than one layer of application, and this one is no exception. One commentator recommends that we honestly evaluate ourselves as we hear this parable because it's filled with theological significance. Yes, the parable depicts God's patience and persistence in response to Israel's disobedience and starkly exposes the depravity of human sinfulness and its tragic consequences, but the parable is double-voiced and it causes every single reader to recognize their own disobedience. And I'll speak for myself, and I'll admit that I've heard God's word many times and outright rejected it over and over again, and that could be the end of my story. But it's not. And we do well at this point to consider the larger book of Mark. You see, this parable, you know, is told in chapter 12, Jesus dies in chapter 15, so you see what's happening? Jesus announces what's going to happen to the son. They took him, killed him, threw him out of the vineyard before it actually takes place. Jesus says that because he knows how the big story 
is going to end. And he knows that his death will not be the end of the story. See, instead of seeking vengeance on those who put his son to death, what does God do? This is the review of the Easter story, because God raises his son from the dead. Instead of poetic justice, there's a whole new beginning. Instead of measure for measure retribution, there's a dispensing of forgiveness. What human beings mean for evil, God transforms into something good. And through the resurrection of a son, an entirely new kind of inheritance becomes possible. It was that old song at the end of the parable that gives you and I a hint, kind of a, a foreshadowing, that old Psalm 118, which, wait a minute, we heard a week before, didn't we? We heard that same psalm on Palm Sunday, because that's the one that's quoted when the people are shouting Hosanna and waving the branches. But there's more. There's a second part, and that's the part that we heard in this parable. Psalm 18 also declares that something that was cast, uh, not even recycled, but outright rejected, has now, in fact, become the chief cornerstone of an indestructible building that's not going to be made with human hands. You know, I'm astonished by this story because so much of the gospel is articulated here. Not least that what you and I cast off and reject becomes the foundation for a whole new enterprise of grace. And each of us are freely invited to be a part of it, regardless of how many times we've rejected God's word. Last point, you got to listen to me, okay, right now, dial in. Because I want to know who is it that's telling us this parable in Mark chapter 12. And you're right, if you're concluding, it's the son himself. The very one who's willing to be taken and killed and thrown out of the vineyard the very son who is raised to life after saying, Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. That's the shocking hope of Easter. That's worth reviewing and worth you and I celebrating again right now. We're going to continue in worship, but just before that, I want you to join me in prayer, okay? Just pause for a moment. If you're on YouTube, just, just, just for a moment. Because Lord Jesus, you're the vine and we're the branches. And you've promised that if we abide in you, we'll bear fruit, and it'll be fruit that remains. Our Father, we thank you for your word today. We confess that so often we resist and we reject the good things that you have for us. And yet still, you're reaching out to each one of us, even right now through the power of your Holy Spirit. So give us the courage, give us the joy to respond and to do so in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Ensemble, and David, for your music collection. How often do we need to be reminded when we throw up our arms in despair and say, what am I supposed to do? Bow the knee. Who are we trusting in? Who's leading us? Who has his plan? God does. Let's trust him. Well, as we come together as a church and uh, looking at the, at the weeks ahead, I uh, just want to provide some announcements. Well, we're going to be continuing to bow the knee. Uh, we're having an extension of the special business meeting that happened on April the 3rd. At the request of the Board of Deacons, the moderating is calling the special business meeting on Wednesday the 24th of April at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. And there will be a time to uh, continue the uh, discussion for the 2024 future staffing structure. And so uh, let's just continue to keep that in prayer as we come together as a church family and uh, discern God's will as we bow the knee. And there's a special prayer meeting in, the, in relation to that happening here this uh, coming week on Wednesday, April 17th, where we'll be having an opportunity as a church from 6.30 to 7.30 to pray together. That's the only business. Bring it before God. Come and make that a part of your day. There's also going to be a day of prayer for BSBC on Sunday, March 21st, as we are asking all of our church family to uphold the future staffing structure and the method for which we, fo- we move forward through this process. May it be God leading us in this season of our life as a church. Also, on Tuesday, April 23rd, there's going to be a BSBC worship night uh, led by uh, John Wilton and his team. It's going to be here in the sanctuary at 7.30 on that Tuesday evening, and it'll be time for prayer and praise and just uh, worshiping together. And as a church family, uh, we go through difficult times, and uh, I have a word of thanks from John and Gwen Childs, who want to, to thank you for being you. Being a part of the family, as they have shared in their time of grief and loss, they are so grateful for your kindness. This coming Monday, uh, 55 plus, this is your chance. Great meals being prepared. I I, I think I I was out to Costco on Friday, and I I think I saw Bill and uh, Dave, who were in tow with a, a large cart. Going out to a vehicle. I think that was the contents for this meal coming up on Monday. That was my idea, Bill. It looked very suspicious. I know you were not under there under Secret Service or anything like that. Very public. But I know they always have a great meal. And if you're 55 plus, even if you're not 55, I don't think they will turn you away. But it's a great opportunity and to, to gather together and to have some fun. There will be a special speaker in the program to finish off uh, the um, the luncheon. There's also going to be a Bible uh, class that is going to be dealing with uh, curious verses in the Bible. And if you have that curiosity bee in your, in your bonnet and you're looking at scripture and you say, That's a, help me make sense of this. Well, there's going to be an opportunity beginning on Wednesday evenings at 6.30, starting on May 1st, so you can join in and uh, learn and study God's word together. Another way you can help is muffin ministry. Uh, There is a need for three dozen muffins for the April 21st week. Uh, Each week in, um, let me read this again. We require three dozen muffins on April 21st and each week in May and June. And uh, this is from the Social Action Commission uh, team that are actively involved in our street ministry where they offer muffins to those that are out on the streets. Security volunteers are also being uh, recruited here for our church facility. So if you're interested in being a part of that team, reach out to Dwight Caldwell, and uh, he will be there to assist you and help you get set into uh, the routine. There is an opportunity this summer for uh, a student who uh, can be uh, working with the Next Gen Children and Youth Ministries. And if you're interested in uh, being... uh, a part of the, of the ministry here this summer, uh, speak to Pastor Nikki, and she will give you the details. And the youth, well, tonight, they're doing a youth group escape room. So 
Um, I remember the first time I did an escape room. I'm glad I had some younger minds there with me. <laughs> and they're going to have a blast. So let's just be praying for our youth as they join together in some fun and activity and build community. So with all of these things being said, what are we leaving with here this morning? It's all about Jesus. How much do you love him? Let's sing together. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. Father God, as we come to the close of this service, we know that our worship continues as we live our lives out for you. May we know your spirit by his power, with his truth, with his courage, and with his boldness. Speak and live out your word in ways that will show your love, show your compassion that you've shown to us, that they too may know you and walk with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.